hundreds of thousands of years because neurodiversity, diversity of brains and genes is vital to human evolution. Mm-hmm. Darwin was right about one thing. When he said survival of the fittest, I don't agree with that. The gene pool is diverse because all that genes want to care about is surviving. So it's going to give you lots of different variants in case one subtype mm-hmm, yeah. fails. So yeah. we need that this diversity and we always have. Mm-hmm. Going a little bit into your own personal history, when did you find your focus in being an advocate and how did that come about? Mm Because you talk a lot about how um, people on the spectrum find these incredible areas of concentration to um, innovate Mm -hmm. within. So um, I found out I was autistic when I was 27, Mm -hmm. Um, but I knew I was different all my life Mm -hmm. because people kept telling me. Yeah. You're weird. You're quirky. There's something strange about you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just kind of put it down to my personality mm-hmm. and the difficulties I had gone through. But I found out definitively that I was autistic because of my son. Mm-hmm. Um, my son is speech apraxic, which means he speaks non-traditionally. He won't speak like you and I. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very limited. And it's also quite muffled because of the coordination. Um, mm-hmm. And he has some learning difficulties too. So we're very different autistics, mm-hmm. but we're also, I've never met anyone more similar to me. Mm-hmm. And our differences, yes, they're there, but our autism, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we emote, the way we make sense, the way we regulate is the same. And that identity is just so beautiful to have. Mm-hmm. But how can I have it if I don't know I'm autistic? Yeah. So diagnosis was vital, but it came late. It came 27 years of age. And... It took me two years to really accept it because I just didn't feel like it belonged to me. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was robbing people who needed the label more than me mm-hmm. until I realised that was just rubbish. Mm-hmm. And I started agony because I knew that other people were feeling like me. And I wanted to normalise autism and demystify it mm-hmm. by giving it a face and giving it a voice and saying, I'm one autistic person. And this is why I do what I do and think how I think. Mm-hmm. And it just went from there because lots of other people were saying, you're like me, and I hardly ever get to see that. Yeah. So thank you, because mm-hmm. I don't feel so alone. And that's all it is. They're drawn mm-hmm. to me because they don't feel so bloody alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why it's gotten so, yeah. so good, I think. Um, on that note, could you talk about... Um supporting instead of repressing behaviors Mm -hmm. that are um, sometimes symptomatic of autism that maybe make other people uncomfortable and Mm -hmm. people try and repress those and then say you're cured because you have those under control. Totally, that's the stimming mostly that is. Liam, could you grab me a scarf or my blanket? Sorry, just I get a bit shivery sometimes. I I struggle to regulate my temperature. Body movement is heavily politicized and none of us really understand it we all take it for granted but if you're Mm -hmm. autistic you'll know that body movement is very controlled and Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is we are all taught and expected to sit stand listen interact learn in -hmm. the same ways Mm -hmm. because if you don't it's disruptive to the status quo or disruptive to somebody else's learning And what autistic people have been taught is that our ways of learning and our ways of coping and our ways of regulating, our ways of interacting, we've been taught that they're quite disruptive. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of them can be. Some of them are challenging to us. So stimming can become harmful when we're distressed. Mm -hmm. So it can become um, bitey or scratchy or or harm, like smacky. But it's a regulation and the stimming isn't what's causing harm. The stimming is an indicator. It's a mm-hmm. communication that I'm not okay. So when I see stimming, instead of seeing it as a disruption and trying to repress it, see it as a communication. Okay. This person's overwhelmed, or this person may be expressing happiness, actually, or excitement. Mm-hmm. But it is up to the other people to play detective and decide whether whether that person's behavior is really impacting them or affecting them or whether it's impacting what they expect. Mm -hmm. Because often we're told to stop singing or humming or stop talking about passion because it's abnormal or it makes me feel uncomfortable is Mm -hmm. what I get. Yeah. Um, But with the 
things like flapping and pacing and rocking and jumping, that's our sensory profile. And I've learned that if I can attend to my sensory profile, which is regulate it, move when I need to move, move when I'm anxious, and that allows me to be calmer and stiller. Mm -hmm. So what I've also seen is people teaching autistics to just not stim. Mm -hmm. And it means that autistic people will go from day to day and life to life, not stimming, Mm -hmm. masking, passing off as non-autistic, passing Mm -hmm. as neurotypical, which means giving you the eye contact and staying quite quite still, yeah? Well, whereas if I'm with all other autistics, we can have conversations and we'll be like this. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely fine. We're not misinterpreting each other. Mm-hmm. And we, we will say to each other as well, oh, that's overloading me. So we just understand. We remove each other from each other. Okay. So it's about communicating. And if someone is presenting with challenging behaviours, it's always looking at why. Mm-hmm. So if you really want to stop something, ask yourself why first. Because if you're stopping something, which is somebody's coping mechanism, um, I actually think it's against our human rights. Yeah. So it's really important to ask, why do you want to stop it? And why is this behavior even happening? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. 